Okay, we're in the home stretch. And by now you know that idealism is not for sissies. Okay? If you read the National Post, especially the way I like to read it, the old-fashioned way, you will probably have come across the work of Matthew Fisher. He's one of Canada's few last remaining authentic foreign correspondents who goes out into the world and sees with Canadian eyes. It's not only the case that uh, Canadian newspapers and broadcasters have been cutting back over many years, but that in particular, the recent devastation in those businesses has seen the laying off of almost most of our foreign correspondents. So Matthew is a kind of lone survivor. Normally he's out there in the trouble spots where crazy people kill each other. Every once in a while he comes back to Canada and the column that I'm holding here, he actually unpacks the liberal gyrations over our aerial defense strategy and sovereignty. When I was chatting to him the other day, he said, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. What do you suggest I should talk about? And I said, why don't you come out on stage and just read your travel itinerary for the last couple months? <laughs> Matthew, come out here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I met Moses about 10 years ago in Israel, and I'd lived in Israel for a number of years. Moses had been in the country, I think, 24 hours, and he invited me out to show me Israel. <laughs> and uh, we went all over Tel Aviv, as I recall, and down to the waterfront, and he knew all kinds of great restaurants, all kinds of dives. Uh, he knew every aspect of the society in Tel Aviv in a way that I didn't get at all. Mind you, I lived in Jerusalem, which is a kind of somber place when you compare it to Tel Aviv, but that's where I met Moses, and I'm in his debt for that great evening and also for his gracious invitation to come here with you today. I do have something uh, to show you. Audiovisual is not really my thing, but uh, Moses spoke about how journalism is dying or has lots of trouble. I am a dinosaur. I'm the last almost of a breed. I've been abroad really for about 43 years. I've lived abroad for 32 years. I've worked in 164 countries. I've covered 19 wars and uh, it, it has been a very interesting life. It started with the telegraph that is how I filed my copy, and then telex machines, and then those early Trash 80 Radio Shack computers that would work at about 400 baud, and you had these couplers, you acoustic couplers you'd put on a telephone to file. And today, I can file with satellite phones, uh, uh, linked to computers, and all kinds of things that people did no, not know about before. I will give you an example of the new journalism as practiced by me, and it's shot, this particular uh, thing they're going to show you was shot with this iPhone on the front lines in Iraq about 800 meters away last year from the Islamic State positions. If you would, I hope it works. Are you up? This is the view that some of the Canadian military advisors to the Kurdish Peshmerga will have when they are sent out to assist with coalition airstrikes on Islamic State targets. Just below this mountain is the town of Bashika. It is under Islamic State control. Off in the haze, 10 kilometers away, are the outskirts of Mosul. It is the most important city still held by the jihadis. The two sides, Islamic State and the Peshmerga, are so close to each other on Bashika Mountain that it was possible last spring to hear Islamic State fighters preparing a rocket attack on this very outpost. This is not a combat mission, but some Canadian mentors will have a ringside seat when the Peshmerga go out to push towards Baghdad and what may be the final battle against Islamic State. When that happens is not known, but it is still many, many months and perhaps a year or more away. That is an example of the kind of work that a print journalist now has to do in order to survive in the business. I, I do a lot of these things. I am not very good at them. I realize that they're just shot 
with this simple little device, but it is amazing that you can transmit this, and within a few hours of my doing that, that was last year, uh, the report came through. By the way, I said it would take a long time before that final push. We are still waiting for that final push. Those troops there, the Peshmerga, who have Canadian advisors, have not moved more than a couple of meters since that was shot 14 months ago, uh, and uh, things go very, very slowly in, in Iraq. Um, I've been at this for 43 years. Uh, I uh, got advice from my father. You know, parents give you great advice that you don't heed, and I never heeded much of the advice I got from my mother or father, but one time I did, and I'm very grateful to my father for this. We were driving, I'm from northwestern Ontario, and we were driving along Lake Superior uh, around Nipigon, and my father asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up. And uh, I was 16, and I said, I don't really know, but I would like to travel. And my father said, well, that's great. Just make sure someone else pays for it. <laughs> and uh, I've been very, very lucky. I am at the end of a cycle where journalists could go places, and I've had about $3 million worth of travel at other people's expense. Um, I've traveled at least 220 days a year for over 40 years. Uh, I'm not particularly well-educated. I have a high school education and all these Nobel Prize winners and all of this kind of bowl me over. It also bowls me over that they are so nice and polite uh, with me when I don't have any education. But I wanted to go out very soon into the world. It was 19 that I went to my first war, the revolution in Mozambique. It was an absolutely wild place. The, the zoo had been opened and monkeys were all over the streets uh, running around. Um, the, uh, the revolution was underway. Portuguese nuns, it was a Portuguese colony, were fleeing what was still called Lorenzo Marquez. It's now called Maputo. And uh, they were fleeing. And at the airport, there were cavity searches of the nuns when I was there by boys with machine guns who were about 14 years old. That was my first sort of raw idea, although I wasn't in combat, uh, of this kind of life. And, and it really appealed to me. I have been very fortunate to have had such a long career and that I am still underway, although budgets are getting very tight. Uh, I've managed to go to the North Pole, to the magnetic North Pole. Uh, I've uh, been on an iceberg for 10 days, an iceberg that was about 100 miles long. Uh, out in the Arctic Ocean, I've gone the entire length of the Mackenzie River on a barge. I've gone on a skiff up the Amazon for a couple of thousand uh, uh, kilometers. Uh, a tarantula once when I woke up was literally one inch from my eye. It filled my whole field of view uh, when I woke up there. Uh, I could talk about many, many different events in different places. Uh, uh, I've been to a lot of funerals. The funeral for Princess Diana, I stayed out overnight on the streets. Uh, uh, near the mall uh, in uh, Britain. I was just there a couple of days ago to see the Queen on her 90th birthday go by the very spot where I stood as the mourners went uh, during that funeral. I've been to the funerals of Mother Teresa, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, Indira Gandhi, uh, uh, King Hussein in, in Jordan, uh, a lot of events like this, royal babies. Uh, I did both uh, Princess Charlotte and Princess George, or Prince George's birth. Uh, so I, I've been very, very, very fortunate because today very few young journalists get the kind of opportunities that I have. I've, I've also gone, it's true, uh, to a lot of difficult spots as Moses referred to. And I had this crazy idea when I was young that I wanted to see people die. Uh, I admit that that was a motivating factor. My father had had a good war, as Peter Worthington, who wrote for years in Toronto, said of my father, he had a great war. And I said, why? And he said, well, he came home alive. Um, my father was in a combat unit that suffered very heavy casualties. And my mother was a, a coding clerk uh, in Britain, and she was working on codes, deciphering codes from the Nazi uh, wolf packs uh, out in the Atlantic Ocean. Some of these coders, there have been movies about them, and it's quite famous. My mother was not in the brains part of the operation. She actually did the bulwark of figuring out 
uh, what was what after she was given the mathematical work b by others. But I grew up in a household that talked a lot about war. My mother was there for the entire Blitz, for example, and about going down into the, uh, the tube during the Second World War. So I wanted to go out. That's what motivated me to go to Mozambique. That's what motivated me to go to so many places and to see dead people. And I can tell you that once you've seen a person die, it isn't really, of course, awful. You should never want this at all. But that is how I, I started it out. Uh, I've seen people murdered within a few feet of me uh, a few times. I've had a man die who was shot by a sniper standing beside me. I, I've been kidnapped a few times. Uh, things like that. Uh, but you try to put that aside, try to remember the good times, the camaraderie, and there are, there are a lot of good times. You also get a chance to meet remarkable people. The greatest event that I think I ever attended was Nelson Mandela's inauguration. I had a very good seat for that. It was a fantastic event. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I enjoyed it for the South African people that day. Uh, to see the millions of people, sort of this undulating wave of humanity, just going out and all cheering and hoping for the man was tremendous. I went right from there to Rwanda, to the genocide. And uh, literally, overnight, I, I was up in Nairobi. I flew into um, Kigali, Rwanda. And my first view as the uh, Canadian Hercules, it was a hot landing. We were under fire. Um, uh, there was artillery uh, attack um, around. There, there were snipers uh, and there was heavy machine gun fire. We landed and it was a hot landing, which meant they were just opening the back of the door of the aircraft, pushing the cargo out. You had to get out and the airplane never really stopped and just kept on going and took off again. Uh, so it would only be on the ground for 30 seconds or so. Uh, my first view of Rwanda was a pair of pants on the runway as the door came down. Uh, the rest of the body had been eaten by dogs. Uh, every war, dogs are a feature. They eat all the bodies. And all there was, there were no legs uh, or, or no feet. There was just legs, no upper body. That was my first view. A Canadian uh, who works for the CIA met me at the airport. A lot of French Canadians work in Africa for the CIA. Um, because the Americans don't trust the French and they need French speakers, so it falls to Canadians. It's a true story. It's a true story, and there are lots of French Canadians employed by the CIA. Uh, this fellow took me to Romeo Dallaire's headquarters, and uh, he's one of the bravest and most fascinating men I've ever met. Um, he uh, slept and worked in one small room. His bed was made up military style very beautifully made. He polished his boots, everything. He was a soldier to the core. Uh, he was on the phone constantly to Kofi Annan, who was then in charge of UN peacekeeping, begging for help. And I could listen to these conversations. And Kofi Annan was telling him to calm down. There was no problem. He was exaggerating. There was no genocide at all. Don't be ridiculous. And he would keep pleading and be told uh, that no help was coming, that they were going to, it was a Friday, and they were going to have a meeting on Monday at the United Nations to discuss the problem. And uh, so Romeo Dallaire was left alone. The Belgian peacekeepers died. Thousands of others died. And Romeo Dallaire would go through these checkpoints by himself, driving the vehicle, his bodyguard, the only other person with him, beside him. And these kids, drunk on banana beer with machetes, would literally be carving people up all around us. Uh, going in from the airport, I'm guessing that I saw 10,000 bodies. There were so many bodies on the road that literally when the vehicle went over, it was like cordwood. Uh, that you were going over uh, on the road to get into town. Uh, Romeo Dallaire is still a friend of mine today. I, I saw him last about a year ago. Uh, that has had a profound uh, effect on him and his life. Um, I've got a lot of other things I want to talk about, and I already see the time is, is, is drawing down. Uh, there was a reference to penises in the title of a story yesterday from one of the speakers. Uh, uh, the fellow who was dealing with data from Google and how he thought he could work a penis into a title and the book publisher didn't like it. And I thought, well, that's what I want my book to be titled. <laughs> the, I want my book to be titled, if I ever do an autobiography, How My Penis Saved My Life. <laughs> and it's a true story, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, it has nothing to do with sex. 
but uh, it was in Russia, and it was when Yeltsin was under fire, uh, the Duma had been attacked, and the crowd, the mob, had moved on to Ostankino, the TV tower on the outskirts of Moscow, and I went there with Howard Witt of the Chicago Tribune, and uh, it was very cold, it was November, and uh, we could see men on the roof aiming down at the protesters, but nothing happened. And after a few hours, and I was freezing, I told Howard, who had wheels and the subway system, the metro system had been closed, take me away from this, take me away. I got this hot date with this beautiful Russian girl tonight. And he said, what kind of journalist are you? We're on the world's biggest story, we must stay. And so we stayed another hour or two, and then I begged again. And finally, after many hours, and it was dark, Howard agreed that if nothing happened in 20 minutes, we could go. After 20 minutes, and I'm watching the clock, I said, let's go, Howard. And we left. And we'd walked maybe as far as the end of this hall when the Russian uh, security forces opened up on the crowd and killed over 200 people. And Howard turns to me at that moment and said, your penis just saved my life. <laughs> and... And uh, I think it would make a provocative title. My mother's 95. If she were to pass away, I might just try it. <laughs> I make fun of death, but I have seen and known a lot of people who have died. Uh, the first was Dal Torgerson of the Los Angeles Times when I was in Central America in the 1980s, and he was blown up uh, by a landmine. A colleague of mine, my winter replacement, Michelle Lang of the Calgary Herald, I was blown up by an IED in Afghanistan. I'd been outside the wire over 200 times, nothing had happened to me. On her first trip outside the wire, she'd been out about 20 minutes, and uh, she was hit by a 2,000-pound bomb. It killed her instantly, four soldiers died, and a woman from the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs, now Global Affairs, a, a young woman diplomat, became a, a quadriplegic. Uh, she survived. I, I believe she was the only survivor of that accident. So I, I've known the tremendous co uh, uh, cost that comes with this. Also, just a few weeks ago, I was in the Philippines, and a friend of mine, John Rizdel, was beheaded by Abu Sayyaf. And um, I've known John for quite a while. He's a very good man. I'm sure all of you would like him. Uh, he had been a journalist, uh, uh, a quintessential Canadian, curious, very polite, uh, interested in the world. And um, his life was taken in the worst way possible. Uh, another Canadian subsequently, just a couple of days ago, who I didn't know, Robert Hall, was killed. And this puts governments in a bad position. Everybody wants to know, what do you think about this? I agree with what the Harper government's position was and which the Trudeau government has continued, which is you cannot negotiate with these people. And I've told my own family that if I should ever be in such a position, that's it because you encourage them to continue. And it's a horrible position for politicians to be put in that they have these questions hanging over them. But it is something uh, that I agree with. I forgot my best story, so I'll have to save it for a next, another invitation, I think, from, from you, Moses. But, but I would just tell you in closing that I do this, it's sort of like a moth to the flame going back again and again. I don't do it as much as I used to, but it is because, not because I feel a great sense of responsibility. So many young journalists say, well, you've got the burden of, of carrying the truth to people. And I say, no, I only have one rule in journalism, and that rule is that I must have fun. And um, they look aghast at this. But I say, I don't mean that I should be joking all the time, but I should find it interesting and enjoyable to go out to these places. And, and I've been in some very, very bad places. And that is why, for another time, I'll tell you why I think Canada's defense policy is crap, and we must spend an awful lot more on our national defense and become more engaged in the world. Okay. Matthew. If you need, if you want another few minutes, you are welcome to them. You really have. Well, and, and I'm pleased you want to get into some hard geopolitics because our next speaker, I'm certain, will get into this amazing American election we're heading into, possibly the most divisive ever on the horizon. I'm sure you have opinions. Oh, everybody does. And I know you've got opinions about 
well, the liberal well, policy I, on I these I have things. a lot of opinions about the liberal government, but I probably will spare them because I sense that this audience might not welcome. Well, uh, no, I heard some, them. I, some I, of my I, opinions I, about very I was with the Prime Minister a few weeks ago in Japan, uh, and he gets a great, pub, uh, great publicity everywhere, but I find it very... Uh, I find him underwhelming. Uh, frankly, he doesn't know anything at all. He's like a babe in the woods, just repeating what somebody has told him. Uh, I don't know if he has principles or convictions, because I don't think he knows himself. But that really is for another time. What I would tell you, because I know a lot of you do support him and don't support the other guy uh, who preceded him, but the story I just wanted to tell you about was really raw combat, because I speak usually to military audiences and journalists, uh, journalism students, and that is what they want to hear, and I didn't get in to the stories, the minutia of what it's like. And I would just tell you the short version is that I was the only Canadian embedded with an American combat unit in the war in 2001. And it was for the push up all the way to Tikrit. Uh, it was, the unit was involved in the final battle of the war in the first. And it's a very long story that takes about an hour to tell. But the short part is we had 110 uh, light armored vehicles on a road at night going 60 miles an hour, a yard apart in blackout conditions. And I was terrified the vehicles would all get uh, whacked together. And all the kids in the vehicle are 17 or 18 years old with me and they can't figure out why an old bugger like me would even want to be in this position. But we hear on the radio that uh, ahead of us some men are on the road and uh, they seem to be friendly. They're in a pickup truck. And then I hear the words AK-47. And before the guy can finish with the 47 part of AK, Everything lights up. We've been surrounded in a 360 ambush by the only Iraqi unit in the whole war that would fight. And it was a, a huge battle. And very soon, the colonel, who's never on the radio network, got on, and he called in. He, he said, uh, slingshot, 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 three times. He said these words, very dramatic. And I said to the guys, what does that mean? And Because they all went, shit, and worse than that. And. Uh, I said, what is it? And they said, he's just called an airstrike on our own position. And um, so 19 aircraft went at supersonic speed. All the aircraft on bombing missions over Iraq dropped their missions. And with whatever missiles and whatever other ordnance they had on board, they came to our position. The next vehicle had an F-18 pilot as a spotter who lasered targets. Tanks had been discovered moving towards us, and they would have taken us out. And so 19 aircraft dropped their bombs within a couple of minutes, three minutes, danger close, within a thousand meters of our position. The ground shook, hundreds of people died, and th the battle was over. And uh, the, uh, to tell you, I witnessed all this through this little glass window, and I only saw half of the battle because it was a 360, and I was looking out one side, but when we came back, we reversed and came back, my tongue was split. And that's because, and I didn't know this, you get such a rush of adrenaline and you're not producing any saliva. And my mouth was so dry that literally the middle of my tongue in those few minutes had just been, uh, been split terribly. Also people, the last part of this story is the Marines, um, uh, there was no censorship when I was with them. I, a lot of journalists gave me hell for being with U.S. Marines, Canadian journalists, because they said I was only seeing part of the story. We had other journalists in Baghdad and other places. I didn't agree with them, but uh, when we got back to a safe position, we went back about 50 miles. The captain of the vehicle, he's now a colonel, uh, in, in Washington, uh, he jumped down like a cat off the vehicle when I was dictating my story, and I said the Marines had retreated. And he jumped down off the vehicle right in my face, and there was no censorship, but he said, Marines don't retreat. And I said, well, what do you call it? We just moved backwards 50 miles an hour at 60, 60 uh, 50 miles at 60 miles an hour, and he said to me, it's a strategic repositioning of forces. <laughs> but even with that message, I was allowed to send in my story without any censorship, and I think that's very important. The only time I've ever been censored in all the work I've done overseas, other than by the Russian government and things like that, is uh, by the British military censors. Uh, never by the Israeli censors, although they can be difficult, and never ever by any Canadians or Americans, and I lived in Afghanistan with the Canadian troops for many years. 
Uh, that's, that's it. It's not a kicker. But I am a dinosaur, and I'm glad that you guys are paleontologists who are interested in <laughs> seeing the last of a species. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew, Matthew, we're going to take a picture. Here, here, here. Oh, oh, oh. We'll take a picture. Okay, okay. my buddy. <laughs> okay, good buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, a little bit? Yeah. I wear the Montreal Canadiens hat. Probably. Because it gets Canadians overseas to talk to you. <laughs> and so I wear it every day. Because we love the Habs or hate them, Canadians will come and talk to you, and some of them are very interesting people who are overseas. <laughs> so that's why. That's good, that's good. Okay, let's get out of here.